Thank you very much. So, hello everyone. Welcome to the last lecture uh, in the NYU AI School. Um, we're ending on a very, very, very exciting note. Um, today we have with us Jennifer Watman Vaughan. Uh, Dr. Vaughan is a senior principal at Microsoft Research she, uh, in New York City. Her research background is in machine learning and algorithmic economics. In recent years, she's turned her attention to fair and interpretable machine learning as part of Microsoft Research's FATE group. Jen came to MSR, uh, which is Microsoft Research, in 2012 from UCLA, where she was an assistant professor. She completed her PhD at the University of Pennsylvania in 2009 and subsequently spent a year at Harvard. She is the recipient of Penn's Dissertation Award, an NSF Career Award, a Presidential Early Career Award, and a handful of Best Paper Awards. In her spare time, Jen is involved in a variety of efforts to provide support for women in computer science. Most notably, she co-founded the annual workshop for women in machine learning, which has been held every year since 2006. Jen, we're so happy to have you here. Please take it away. Great, thank you so much. So let's see, got my audio, we've got my video. I'm going to share some slides. Hopefully you all can actually hear me. Great, okay. Give me one second here. Fantastic. Um, so I'm really excited to be here talking to all of you today and um, you know, excited that you're willing to stick with me for this at the very end of what I assume has been a long week for all of you, but um, hopefully it will be worth it and you will have no regrets here. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you for the next two hours or so about fairness and transparency in machine learning. Um, now, I don't know about all of you, but I find these virtual talks really exhausting, even when it's not the end of an already long and busy week. Um, and I tend to find it kind of difficult to connect with the audience when we're not all together in the same room. So one thing that I've been trying out when I give talks over the last couple of months is starting out with just a little bit of backstory on my own research interests and how it is that I came to be interested in some of the topics that I'll talk to you about. So I'm going to do that today as well. Um, as you heard in the introduction, my name is Jen Wortman Vaughn. I am a senior principal researcher at Microsoft Research in New York. Um, today I'm talking to you from my home in Brooklyn. I've been at Microsoft for about eight years now. Um, and originally my research training was in two areas. So one was machine learning theory, and the other was algorithmic economics. And this means that kind of in my past research life, I spent most of my time designing algorithms and proving formal mathematical guarantees about these algorithms. And I still spend some fraction of my time on that today. Uh, but that's not what I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, these days, I spend much more of my time on human-centered approaches to transparency and intelligibility and fairness and uh, what we at Microsoft refer to as responsible AI more broadly. So a lot of people ask me, how did this happen? How did I go from being uh, more or less a theorist to someone who is focused on all of these um, very practical and human-centered problems? Um, now, I, I can trace my interest in these topics back to one specific event, actually. Um, and it was this panel that I went to in Washington, D.C. back in 2016. It was one of these panels on AI and society that are happening all the time these days. And one of the panelists there made this claim that roughly soon our AI systems will be so good that all of the uncertainty will be taken out of our decision making, right? And to me, I was just so horrified to hear this. This was just a completely horrifying type of claim to hear because we all know that the world is full of uncertainty and all of our AI systems and all of our machine learning models are going to have this uncertainty baked into them, whether we're explicit about it or not. 
And I just found it really irresponsible for someone to be up there, you know, in front of the media and all of these people telling them that AI can just take our uncertainty away. So after this event, I came back to my office in New York fuming about this. And I immediately ranted about this to my colleague and good friend, Hannah Wallach. And Hannah and I spent the next month or two after this um, kind of dissecting this claim and why it was that it bothered us so much. So just for a little bit of context, this was you know, 2016. This was right around the time that Hillary Clinton's chance of winning the US election was hovering around 80%. And everyone was treating this like it's a done deal. Um, it was around the time that people started talking about democratizing AI, right? So making it easier for lay people to build and deploy their own machine learning systems. And watching all of this play out and just replaying this panelist's quote over and over in my mind, I became really obsessed with this question of how well people actually understand the predictions that are coming out of models. Now, as someone who was trained in machine learning theory, I was basically trained to always state my assumptions really clearly and explicitly. And the stating of assumptions is really core to what I do and how I think about machine learning research. And I was afraid that people might not always understand um, what assumptions are being made or the implications of all of the assumptions that go into machine learning models or the uncertainty behind any prediction. So these worries led me to discover the literature coming out of the machine learning community on intelligible or interpretable machine learning. And I got really hung up on the fact that people were designing all of these methods for interpretable machine learning without actually stopping to define exactly what they mean by interpretability or intelligibility basically proposing solutions without first defining the problems that they're trying to solve. So I started talking about um, this problem with colleagues of mine with different backgrounds. So folks from psychology and other human centered fields, HCI. Um, so people who know about behavioral experiments and about user studies and so on. And I started running user studies of my own to try to see how interpretability plays out in practice. And I ended up just getting really excited about this area, the more work that I do in it. And it's now kind of one of the major themes of my research, which I'm going to be telling you more about in the second half of this talk. Um, the other main theme of my research these days is around fairness in machine learning and specifically what this looks like in practice in industry, because I happen to work in industry. Um, I also started working on fairness around the same time that I started working on intelligibility. And this is the talk that, or the topic that I'll focus on in the first half of the talk today. So I'm going to jump right into that in a few minutes. Um, I should mention that credit for many of the slides in this section of the lecture should go to my colleague, Hannah Wallach. Um, we actually originally developed a lot of this material on fairness together for a webinar that we gave almost two years ago now. Um, before I get into that, let me just say a little bit about logistics here. So I can't actually see the chat or questions that are coming in or anything like that, but I do really encourage people to ask questions, especially if you need clarifications or anything like this. So um, please do this. And the um, folks who are responsible for organizing this amazing um, AI school will keep an eye on that and jump in if uh, there are clarification questions. I will also pause several times um, while I'm talking to uh, specifically stop to take questions when it's a good point to do this. So uh, please, especially because we are at the end of a long week and this is a two hour lecture, um, I would love it if people are interactive, um, challenge things I say, ask questions, all of this. Okay, so with that said, let me jump right in. All right, so as machine learning has become more common, we've seen an increasing number of examples of these really high profile cases where machine learning has gone wrong, right? Uh, these examples regularly show up in headlines, in the news, and I'm sure that all of you have seen some of these. 
Now, many of these stories that we see in the news are focused on high stakes domains. So cases in which machine learning systems are used to allocate important opportunities or resources or information in ways that can have a significant impact on people's lives. So as one example, a couple of years ago now, um, Amazon re revealed that um, it had abandoned an automated hiring system after they found that the system amplified gender biases that exist in the tech industry. Um, not that surprising in retrospect, but this is the kind of thing we see. Another prominent example that I'm sure many people have seen was the ProPublica investigation several years back, which showed that Compass, which is a widely used recidivism prediction tool, was racially biased, at least according to some metrics. Um, but other stories have involved much more mundane or at least much less high stakes systems. So for instance, uh, researchers at Princeton in a nice paper in 2017 found that um, if you take most translation systems that are out there and you translate the, the phrases, he is a nurse and she is a doctor from English into Turkish, which is a genderless language, and then back into English, you end up with the stereotypical, she is a nurse and he is a doctor. So different from the sentences that you started with in the stereotypical way. These stories are all examples of AI systems behaving unfairly. But even though we can often spot unfairness in AI systems when we see it, there's no one size fits all definition of fairness that applies to AI systems in all contexts. Fairness is what we refer to as a socio-technical challenge. So this means that it's not something that can be approached from a purely social perspective or purely technical perspective. And that makes it difficult sometimes to recognize and mitigate and define. So, Today, I'm going to give you a high level overview of fairness in AI. I'm going to start by talking about some of the main types of fairness related harms that can occur so that you can learn to recognize them. I'm also going to talk about who might be affected by these harms. So which groups of people might most be most at risk. Um, I'll then briefly discuss how these fairness related harms can be introduced during the machine learning life cycle. And then I'll very briefly run through a few strategies for assessing and mitigating them. Okay. And I just want to emphasize that I think this is a really important topic to cover um, kind of early on for people, even as they're sort of just getting started um, thinking about machine learning systems, uh, because the more that you kind of uh, get used to thinking in terms of these types of harms that can occur, and the more that you start um, just making sure you're asking the right questions every time you think of building a system, the easier it will be for you to spot these types of problems um, when you go out there into academia or into industry and you're actually building these real systems. Okay. Good, so let's start by um, talking about what are the types of fairness related harms that can occur in machine learning systems. And you might be wondering at this point, why it is that I'm referring to everything in terms of harms, instead of something like bias, which is this word that we hear a lot of in the media when people are talking about fairness. Uh, bias is often used as this kind of catch-all way to describe any unfair behavior in AI systems, but um, I tend to actually recommend against using this term. So this is because bias is, um, is ambiguous and it means different things to different communities. So for example, we have statistical bias and societal bias, and it's not always clear or precise what people are talking about when they say this. So um, in my own research and within the fake group at Microsoft, we recommend instead talking about unfairness in terms of specific fairness related harms. This kind of shifts the focus from, um, you know, from this abstract vague notion of bias 
into the actual kind of concrete ways that people are negatively impacted by AI systems. So um, I use this framing and the specific list of harms that I'm going to talk about here is adapted from a paper by Shapiro et al in 2017. Okay, so first up, there are harms of allocation. So harms of allocation can occur when AI systems are used to determine how to allocate opportunities or resources. The example that I mentioned early on in which Amazon's hiring system amplified gender imbalances can be viewed as causing harms of allocation because it might withhold job opportunities from women, right? And harms of allocation are um, the harms that are kind of most commonly covered, I would say, in the machine learning literature on fairness right now, um, not necessarily because they're the most important or the most frequently occurring, but because they're kind of easier to quantify than others in some ways. Okay, next. Quality of service is all about whether a system works as well for one person or one group of people as it does for another even if there are no uh, opportunities or resources that are explicitly, explicitly being extended or withheld. So as one example here, researchers found that three commercial gender classification systems had higher error rates for images of women with darker skin tones than they did for images of men with lighter skin tones, right? So like accessibility issues, quality of service harms can actually raise questions in users about respect and dignity and personhood, right? So imagine how a user might feel if a system repeatedly fails to recognize her voice, you know, say because of her particular accent, but easily recognizes those of her peers. And quality of service harms, I think are really important and don't receive enough attention. Uh, because they can occur in basically any type of machine learning system. Okay, next is stereotyping. So one great example here comes from Latanya Sweeney's work, where she showed that online advertisements were more likely to suggest that people with black sounding names had been arrested, reinforcing negative stereotypes of the black community. Moving on, denigration is where an AI system is itself part of a process that's derogatory or demeaning or offensive. Um, so for example, a few years ago, uh, Google Photos infamously mislabeled an image of a black woman as gorillas. And this mislabeling is offensive, not just because the system made a mistake, but because it specifically applied this label that has a long history of being purposefully used to denigrate and demean people. Okay. Um, and I should say here that, you know, this denigration is not necessarily coming from any ill intentions. Um, all of these harms are not necessarily coming from ill intentions, as we'll see. But when we talk about harms, we're really focusing on just kind of the effect of people in the end, regardless of where they come from. All right, so finally, over and under representation are somewhat self-explanatory, but as a concrete example, researchers at the University of Washington found that for professions with an equal or higher percentage of men than women, such as engineering, image search results were even more heavily skewed toward men than reality. Um, this here is an old screenshot of an image search for CEO. And you can see actually here, um, the only woman who appears is CEO Barbie down in the lower right corner. Um, this has since been adjusted. This is an old screenshot. So to recap, there are these five main types of fairness related harms that can be caused by um, AI systems. And these are allocation, quality of service, stereotyping, denigration, and over and under representation. Um, I should put out, point out that a single system can and often will exhibit more than one of these types of harms. And it can exhibit different harms for different groups of people as well. And of course, some of these can be more severe than others. Uh, okay. Questions? Yes. 
yeah so since you completed the section uh, this is probably more towards the end of the talk but uh, fair enough when people work on fairness and equity in ai and ml do you see instances of people actually taking their learnings into their everyday lives so they can better think about their work and seeing the results of their unfairness that's that's the question like when they work on all of this stuff do they actually take it into like their everyday lives and implement stuff to address it i guess i think so um i mean i can tell you i haven't seen this studied but i can tell you anecdotally that um since i and my colleagues have started working more on these topics um we have certainly started thinking about fairness a lot more in our everyday lives and how this comes up um i mean of course i think that these issues have become more um prominent and more visible in everyday life for everyone um many people in the united states in the past couple of years so um i i don't know that there is so much direct causation there but i think um you know these are issues that are becoming more important in day to day life and more important in um the part of the world that we as people who build machine learning systems control so definitely see these things as related are there more questions no just the one thank you okay. great all right so who is it who is most at risk of experiencing these fairness related harms well sometimes it's the people who will use or operate a system but it can also be other stakeholders who are directly or indirectly affected by a system um either by their own choice or not okay so for example um suppose that we have a facial recognition system that's being used for employee building access right a security guard may be the primary user of the system but um the person entering the building might be harmed if a system makes a mistake and denies them access right whether or not the person entering the building wanted to be using this system um fairness is often discussed in terms of specific groups of people although there are also notions of individual fairness that i won't have time to talk to go into today and there's also a question of where these groups of people come from so um a lot of the time media and other stories and our attention in the research community focus on groups of people that are protected by anti-discrimination laws so these could be groups of people um defined in terms of race or age or disability status um there are many other different groups of people that we might want our systems to be fair with respect to and it's not always easy to identify the most relevant ones um the most relevant group can also be specific to a particular domain or use case so for example if we're thinking about something like automated essay grading or a speech recognition system um in either of these cases it may be more relevant whether or not someone is a native speaker of the language than it is what their age is or their disability status or their race Um it's also really important to remember that different groups intersect. So people within those intersections may be at risk of experiencing additional or extra harms. Um returning to this gender classification example that I mentioned earlier, uh error rates were significantly higher for images of women with darker skin tones than they were for either images of women overall or images of people with darker skin tones overall. So the researchers who conducted this study were only able to uncover this by assessing system performance with respect to skin tone and gender at the same time. So this type of intersectionality can be really important to keep in mind and test for. Um okay. Great. Any more questions at this point? I'm happy for people to raise hands and ask their own questions or Okay. 
we can unmute you if you want to ask questions. So just raise your hand and I'll be monitoring the chat. Okay, great. So let me move on. Where do these types of harms that I'm talking about come from? And why do AI systems behave unfairly? Uh, so if you look at the way that AI systems are portrayed in the media, you naturally kind of assume that the only reason that we're seeing these types of harms is because of biased data sets. Now, data very often is one part of the problem, um, but in reality, the situation can be a lot more complex than this. There are decisions that are made at every point in the machine learning life cycle, and um, these decisions can lead to unfairness and harms. And this can happen even when system designers have the best possible intentions, right? So again, this is not anything about intentions. This is just about where these problems can creep in um, if people are not careful during the development and deployment life cycle. Okay, so starting with data sets, some AI systems do indeed behave unfairly because of societal biases that are reflected in the content of the data sets that are used to train them or evaluate them. Um, returning once again to Amazon's automated hiring system, the system withheld employment opportunities um, from women because of the fact that the training data reflected existing gender imbalance in the tech industry. So in that case, it probably was largely a problem with the data. Uh, going back to the machine translation example I mentioned earlier, people express societal biases in the language that they use. So if it's the case that in society, people are more likely to say she is a nurse than he is a nurse, then a translation system that's trained on text or speech that's generated by people is going to naturally prefer that translation. As a third example here, there's a lot of research showing that societal biases often come into play when labeling data. So um, it's important to develop kind of clear guidelines for crowd workers or for other people who are tasked with labeling our training data and to be careful anytime that you might think about using human judgments as ground truth for a problem. And the example here I have is um, automated essay grading when it's the case that people, when they're grading essays, kind of have their own biases. So again, if we're trading on data, data that comes from human graders, we're going to be incorporating that bias into a model. Uh, now, some AI systems behave unfairly, not because of societal biases inherent to the data used to train them directly, um, but because of other characteristics of the data set. So we see this probably most commonly when a data set isn't sufficiently representative of certain populations. Um, so this is the reason why these three gender classification systems that I mentioned earlier had higher rates, um, higher error rates for images of women with darker skin tones because there just weren't enough images of women with darker skin tones present in the data sets that were used to train these models. Um, so in some cases, uh, we, it may even be the case that the relative proportion of different groups of people in a data set reflects reality. Uh, but this sampling strategy can actually still be insufficient if um, we have much smaller groups, right? That is, sometimes we need to actually over-represent small groups in the training data in order to mitigate unfairness and have a model that works well for all groups. Uh, but beyond data, other AI systems behave unfairly because of assumptions that are made during the development and deployment life cycle. And this can include assumptions about what AI systems can or cannot do and when it's even appropriate to use AI in the first place, right? So as a really extreme example of what can go wrong here, in 2016, a paper came out by a group of researchers who proposed that they proposed training a facial analysis system 
to predict who is going to commit a crime based on images of people's faces. Now, this is extremely worrying for a whole host of reasons and could lead to really substantial harms for people who are misclassified. I hope it goes without saying that even with good intentions, this is a questionable system purpose. And beyond that, it's not something that AI is really capable of doing, right? This is pseudoscience. So in this case, you know, there are assumptions that are bad and it's probably the case that the system should just never be built in the first place. As another example, sometimes systems behave unfairly because of assumptions about um, what a particular data set captures and how this relates to the system purpose. So for example, here, um, a crime prediction system that's trained on arrest data sets uh, relies on the assumption that the number of arrests in a neighborhood is correlated with the amount of crime that's committed in that neighborhood. But this assumption fails to account for the fact that um, there can be high rates of arrest without conviction, for example, or there can be over policing in less affluent neighborhoods. So uh, the resulting system may make inaccurate predictions that reflect these historical policing practices rather than the occurrence of crime itself. Was there a question there? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Are there any sort of regulating bodies or advisory bodies within AI research? Um, are there, what, sorry, what was the question? Reg regulatory or advisory bodies within AI research? Um, yes, let me, let me come back to that question because that's a good question, but I don't want to, that will like totally sidetrack me if I go off at this point, but let's make a note of that for later. It's a good question. There is another question, which was to do with labeling data biases. Um, so you yep. typically introduce biases when labeling data. For example, if I ask someone to label an image of a banana, the human labeler will probably just label the image as banana, not yellow banana or curved yellow banana, etc. How do people in this space go about dealing with issues like this? Um, yeah, that's a good question as well. Um, there, so, I mean, the way that people go about dealing with this is often through trial and error, as it is for many of these issues. Um, but with labeling in particular, um, it's important to just have really clear guidelines for whoever it is who is doing the labeling to um, try as hard as possible to um, be objective. Um, the iteration comes in here because you're never going to get this right on your first try and you always have to just kind of try and iterate to be clear and objective. Um, beyond that, it can be helpful to make sure that you have a lot of diversity in the population who is providing labels, right? So um, we don't wanna be just providing labels to, um, you know, as, from a single group of people who all kind of think in the same way because then we're very likely to miss out on um, a lot of potential issues. And um, I actually, I have a colleague at Microsoft, Alexander Olteanu, who's done some really interesting work in this space, like looking at um, differences in the way that crowd workers with different backgrounds um, label things. Uh, she was particularly looking at the case of um, hate speech. So whether you label um, a phrase or a sentence as hate, hate speech or not, and found that um, whether or not people do label particular phrases as hate speech has to do with, among other things, whether they have personally been a victim of hate speech in the past themselves. So this is kind of an argument for, um, first of all, making sure that you have diversity in the population who is uh, giving you these labels and making sure that uh, when you're thinking about this diversity, you are trying to include people who are going to be likely to be affected or harmed by your system. Great. One last interruption yep. before you go ahead. Are yeah. there any ways that AI and ML researchers prevent these biases? Um, yes, I will come back to that one as well. 
because right. I, I have a section on that later. Okay, good. Um, so there are some more subtle examples here too. Um, so let's go back to the gender classification problem I mentioned earlier. So predicting someone's gender from a photo, right? So on the surface, it might be less obvious how assumptions can lead to fairness related harms here. Um, but there are a couple of reasons. So one is that um, if a gender classifier only predicts binary gender, then it's just never going to work for people whose gender is non-binary, right? Um, gender classification also reinforces uh, societal assumptions about how men and women are supposed to look. And in fact, the way that gender classifiers work is by leveraging these very uh, stereotypes in the data. Right? So they therefore only work well for people who look like stereotypical men or stereotypical women. So um, there are a lot of people in the community who argue that these are also systems that just shouldn't be built. Okay, um, so turning now to characteristics of other system components, um, even the structure of a machine learning model can cause a system to behave unfairly. So in this toy example here, um, we've got people represented by two features, one on the x-axis and one on the y-axis. And the majority and minority population just look fundamentally really different to each other in terms of these features. So as a result, there's no single linear classifier who works that works well for both. And if you want to be able to serve this minority population well, you need to either consider other types of models or introduce other features or something. Okay, as a final example here, AI systems can behave unfairly because of their objective functions, right? So here I'm showing image search results for the term boy on the left and the term girl on the right. And these look very different from each other. Um, this probably comes from the fact that search engines optimize for clicks among other metrics, right? And this is kind of an example that shows just how hard it can be to try to address fairness related harms because there are different ways in which people use different words, right? The term girl may be used in some circumstances referring to a child or to a woman and users search for this term with different intentions in mind. Um, and in this case, you know, one of these may intentions may be more common for girls than it is for boys. Okay, so the list I've given you here is not meant to be comprehensive, but I hope that I've at least convinced you that there are a wide variety of reasons beyond just the data set alone that AI systems can behave unfairly. So some AI systems do indeed behave unfairly because of societal biases that are reflected in the data sets used to train them. This is actually pretty common um, and other characteristics of the data sets, but others behave unfairly because of the way that the initial task was defined in the first place um, or because of other assumptions that were made during the development and deployment life cycle. And finally, again, some systems behave unfairly because of um, other or because of characteristics of other components or decisions like model structures that are too simple to capture diversity or um, objective functions that have unintended consequences. Um, I'll note also that these reasons are not mutually exclusive and they often exacerbate each other, right? So this means that it can be hard to distinguish between them and to kind of pinpoint the cause of unfairness in a system and what needs to be addressed. So, um, Professor, okay. um, uh, since we're on the reasons, so there was a good question about um, the Amazon recruiting incident. Um, if you're aware, do you know if gender was used in the training data set for the AI or was it based solely on factors like skills, experience, et cetera, that seem separate, but can, can be related in reality due to societal factors? Um, so that's a good question. I don't actually know specifically in the case of this Amazon recruiting tool, whether gender was used explicitly as a feature, uh, but 
there's kind of an important point that you're alluding to here, which is that these problems can and often do arise even if you don't like explicitly use group membership. So in this case, gender as a feature. Um, and you know, it, it's sometimes the case that people building systems think that they can get away from unfairness by simply, you know, not looking at gender or not looking at race or um, dropping whatever other sensitive feature from the model. But this typically doesn't work, and it doesn't work because there are so many correlations um, between these properties and um, other aspects of your data. Right, like in the case of hiring, um, it could be, you know, picking up on differences between um, how likely women and men are to, you know, exaggerate when they're listing a big list of all of their skills that they have or something like this, or, you know, all of these subtle things. It, it could be picking up on um, people who are going to, uh, women's universities, like all women universities. Um, it could be picking up on any of any sorts of traits and it's very hard to ever know for sure that you're not picking up on um, an attribute just because you don't include that explicitly. Okay, good. These are great questions. Thank you so much for asking questions. It makes me feel a lot less than I'm, like I'm just kind of sitting in a room talking to myself, so. That's great. <laughs> okay. Um, so we've discussed what fairness related harms look like. Uh, we've discussed the groups of people that might experience them and where they come from. Um, I wanna move on now to the last topic within the fairness segment, which is strategies for assessing and mitigating harms. Um, although I wanna warn you, I'm going to go through these just at a very high level because I don't have time to get into the detail and I'm largely not going to cover the large amount of research that exists in this space. So if you're interested in that, I would point you towards uh, the FACT conference, F-A-C-C-T, which has um, a lot of this type of research there. Um, I also wanna emphasize that I'm purposely using the word mitigating here instead of something like debiasing or similar, because it's generally never going to be possible to guarantee for sure that a system is fair. And when people use words like debiasing, this is kind of setting this unrealistic expectation that it's actually possible to remove all of the bias, bias or unfairness from a system. Okay. So the first thing that you need if you want to assess fairness related harms is some definition of what it means for a system to behave fairly or unfairly. Um, so for example, if we want to assess quality of service harms, we might try to come up with some definition that captures that um, a facial recognition system should not exhibit substantial differences in error rates between groups defined in terms of skin tone and gender and age. Or maybe error rates is not enough depending on the application. And we want to look specifically at something like false positive rates or false negative rates and make sure that um, these are comparable across different groups, right? Um, other specialized fairness metrics have been developed for allocation in particular. Um, and these are covered really nicely in this um, fat star tutorial from a couple of years ago that I have a screenshot of up here. Um, I won't go into those today, but there's been a lot of work in this space. Um, but I, I do want to say that defining fairness criteria for something like stereotyping or denigration is going to be significantly more difficult. And it may be the case that there actually aren't great quantitative metrics that are going to fully capture these harms at all. Um, this is something that computer scientists really don't like to hear because we really have been trained to like quantify everything. Um, but sometimes this is really difficult to do when we're talking about fairness. And now there are several fairness tools out there that allow people building machine learning systems to explore and optimize trade-offs between these different fairness metrics I just mentioned 
and other standard performance metrics like accuracy. So two examples I'm showing here are Microsoft's Fair Learn tool and IBM's AI Fairness 360 tool. And there's actually a lot of interesting research that went into the techniques used in these tools, um, but I don't have time to go into any of that today. But uh, the basic idea behind what they are doing is um, allowing people to kind of have these dual criteria that they're optimizing over and um, find ways to train and select models to use that are, um, you know, satisfying some minimal notion of fairness according to the defined metrics uh, without too much of a sacrifice in other standard performance metrics. However, uh, my own opinion here is that because of the socio-technical nature of fairness, even more than these tools, we really need the right processes in place that allow people um, creating machine learning systems to catch potential fairness issues early, okay? And I'm certainly not alone in this way of thinking. I have many examples of um, processes and um, you know, various workbooks and so on shown here. Um, and over the past couple of years, indeed, many organizations have published their own responsible AI processes and checklists. Um, in my own work, my colleagues and I at Microsoft have worked with machine learning practitioners um, across a bunch of companies to co-design with them a fairness checklist that is aimed to help teams anticipate possible fairness related harms um, and make sure that they're addressing these early. This was in some work that appeared in CHI this last year, 2020. So the checklist items that we include here were designed to prompt critical conversations between um, different stakeholders who are involved in building a system um, and suggest appropriate things that should be documented, appropriate actions that should be taken and so on, um, all, all while supporting existing organizational goals and priorities. Uh, so we're now working with product teams to refine this general checklist to meet specific needs in specific domains and applications and um, actually try to measure how well this helps mitigate unfairness in practice. But the reason that I'm kind of a strong believer in these processes and checklists is that, again, there really isn't one, any one size fits all definition of fairness. It's not something where it's always obvious where the problem is coming from. And what we really need is to start kind of training people to um, ask the right questions, to think through whether they should be building a product in the first place before they start building it, to think through who are all of the stakeholders who could potentially be impacted by the product they're building, to think through possible harms that could happen to them, um, possible ways that they can test for these harms and go back and change things if they need to. We really just need to like take people who are used to thinking in this uh, very engineering, focused, like hitting um, concrete quantitative objectives mindset and get them to step back and think through these socio-technical issues. So this is one of the reasons why I'm really excited to be talking to you all today and hope that I can kind of encourage people to start on this path of thinking through these issues early. Um, at that point, I'm actually at the end of my material on fairness. Um, I'm happy to take some more questions before we do a short break. Um, before I do that, let me go back to this one question that was asked earlier about um, whether there are kind of, uh, I forget the exact wording, but whether there are sort of bodies that are um, overseeing or regulating what is going on in the machine learning community with respect to fairness. Um, so let me answer that in a couple of parts. So one, in terms of regulations, uh, my own view on this, and this is, you know, just my view, I'm not speaking for Microsoft here, just for myself. Uh, I don't think it makes sense to try to have regulations that span all machine learning 
systems um, as a whole or all AI systems as a whole. There's just kind of two diverse of a way that we're using AI and there's not even an agreed upon definition of what AI means, right? And I just, I don't see, um, I, I am not very hopeful about very general regulations. I do think it makes sense in specific domains. And there are actually regulations that apply in specific domain, domains just because historically those domains have been regulated. So um, some examples here are um, in credit and lending. This is a highly regulated domain, actually everything to do with finance. Um, I've been really surprised, like when I talked with people who work at financial institutions, they seem so far ahead of the rest of industry um, in their thinking around fairness, just because they are so highly regulated and this is something like they really have to think about. So um, there are specific regulations in finance. There are specific regulations around um, jobs. Um, you know, there are regulations around advertising of jobs. You um, can't advertise to certain populations and not to others, this type of thing. And all of these regulations carry over when you're using machine learning systems as well. So I think that makes a lot of sense. And I could imagine regulations being introduced in other domains as well. Um, but it's just hard to imagine what this would look like more broadly. Uh, the other related thing I will mention is that um, there is this, um, this organization called the Partnership on AI, which is um, an organization that includes members from somewhere around 100, it might be more at this point, um, other organizations. So these are um, mostly companies, but I think there are some universities involved, um, nonprofits, others, uh, who are all kind of coming together to try to think of, through um, best practices around responsible AI and share best practices with each other. Um, and this is kind of, you know, this is not a regulation, nothing that they're doing is required at this point, but it's a nice way for people in industry to have an opportunity to share what they're going through in the space with others who are going through um, kind of similar processes and uh, try to learn from them and figure out best practices. Okay. That was a very long-winded answer. Are there other questions on the fairness component? So there are some questions in the chat and I can take them in order of posting. So firstly, what are the implications? I'm also happy if people want to ask their own questions and speak up, but you can just keep reading them otherwise. Yeah, you can always raise your hand and I can unmute you. Um, but yeah, so far no one has, but they're very active okay. on chat. <laughs> Great. So what are the implications of implementing AI into social policies? So the context is since many people are skeptical about their personal information and data being openly and privately distributed, classified and stored by governmental agencies or companies to infer diverse assumptions and predictions or for any other purpose. So the question was again, what are the implications of implementing AI into social policies? Um, so I, I feel like there are a couple of different questions in there, maybe, or I'm interpreting at least a couple of different questions. Um, one that, uh, at least in the way that I was hearing this towards the end, was around um, concerns that people who are, say, using systems might have around privacy and just not even wanting to share things like um, sensitive attributes and all of this with companies. Um, and this is something that, you know, we're, we're dealing with a lot in industry already because of um, regulations that are more to do with privacy, like the GDPR in Europe, um, which means that companies are now um, not allowed to store or even collect a lot of um, personal information. Um, one specific way that uh, this has made things challenging in the space of fairness in particular is that if we want to have any hope of being able to evaluate systems for fairness, be it you know, 
quality of service issues or um, allocational harms or any of this, if we want to be able to assess this, we need to have data on the sensitive features of um, the people who we're assessing this with, with respect to, right? So if we want to evaluate a system and make sure that it's working as well for women as it does for men, and we haven't collected or we don't have available to us um, information on gender, this makes it very difficult to even assess if there are problems. Uh, so this is something, you know, there's a lot of active research going on and trying to get around this, um, figure out how we can um, try to do these assessments without this data available, uh, but it's definitely an issue that is coming up. I hope that answered at least part of your question. Yeah, sorry, Kyle, I disabled you for a minute because I forgot this other question. Um, okay. So there was an anonymous question posted about this idea of, um, um, well, to recite it verbatim. Do you think certain levels of classifications will disappear in machine learning? For example, gender, because of how trans exclusionary it is uh, and or can be. I do think so. Um, I do. So I actually, there are existing facial recognition or facial analysis systems out there that have um, dropped gender classification as one of their features in recent years um, because, because it's problematic and also because it is it can be hard to make a case of when we actually need something like this, right? Um, for gender classification in particular, there are often arguments made that this is useful for things like um, targeted advertising. Uh, you may have questions about whether this is a good thing or not, but maybe you know we have a screen that sees you coming into a store and wants to guess what product to advertise for you. But then, you know, it's not really clear that gender is the right feature to be collecting there anyway. Um, but yes, I, I do think that a lot of um, these classification tasks are going to disappear or become less common. And um, I think this is a, a good thing. We're still, I mean, AI in some ways and machine learning are, you know, they've been around a while, but it's still relatively new technology and we're sort of figuring a lot of this out still, but I, I think things are going to change a lot. We have our first volunteer asking a question live. Kyle, you want to go ahead? Okay. Sure. Hey. Hi. Um, thank you for coming to speak. This is really interesting. Um, I don't know if this is you're exactly the right person to um, speak to on this, but it's sort of a question about machine learning and how um, perhaps we can sort of teach, like we've been learning over the last couple of days about how machine learning can um, correct itself and train towards like a certain outcome. Um, and I'm wondering if there's like uh, an ability for machine learning for us to kind of like put values into it so that we can make predictive models about how like a certain policy um, will uh, affect a certain population or something like that. I know it's a huge kind of task to do, but I wonder if there's any sort of um, notion that that could be uh, possible. Yeah, so let me, that's a really good question. Um, I'm going to answer a slightly different question, uh, which is I, I do think, you know, in terms of putting values into our machine learning systems, I think we need to do this and we need to just be more cognizant that we're already doing this. Like a lot of people think that, you know, because machine learning is math, it's objective, but it's not objective, right? We are there defining features, we're there defining the objective function and all of this, like humans are doing this, which means that we are, whether we want to admit it or not, putting values into the systems that we build. Um, I, I think that what needs to change from my perspective in the way that machine learning is taught is to really emphasize that there are these choices that are being made and that these choices are, um, you know, they, they are kind of, 
putting our values into the system, whether we want them to or not. Um, as part of this, uh, I, I complain a lot that the way that machine learning is often taught, or you know, at least when I was taught machine learning, this was the case, is that you kind of start with this premise that you are given a data set and then you learn something from it, right? But the, the data set is always just like given. Anytime you're talking about a machine learning problem, it's like you have this data, what do you do with it? And in the real world, that's just, that's not how it works, right? You're never just given a data set. It doesn't just like come down from the sky. You're always figuring out what data that you're going to use and going out and collecting this data or curating it or something. And that in itself, like just this choice of what data you're using is something that is putting so much of your own values into the system. And this is something that we just like don't even talk about at all when we're teaching machine learning. And I think it's really important. So uh, this is something that I wish was emphasized more. By the way, like related to this, um, I, I did some research where we, we did some need finding with uh, product groups to try to figure out um, you know, whether existing uh, techniques that were coming out of the machine learning literature were going to be helpful to them um, in addressing fairness needs that came up with their products or whether they had other needs that just weren't being met. And this is kind of obvious in retrospect now, but the kind of number one disconnect we found between even the literature on machine learning fairness and how people like the needs of people in the industry who wanted to make their systems more fair was that um, all of the literature tended to focus entirely on models and algorithms. How do you design models and algorithms that will um, give you some sort of fairness guarantee? Whereas in industry, almost all of the emphasis tended to be on the data set. And whenever there are issues, people will go to the data set first and say, how can we collect more data? Or how can we adjust our data set or any of this? Because you know, they didn't want to change their model. Their model was already in place. They don't want to make these major adjustments to their model to get fairness. Um, they really like want to turn first to the data and see how adjustments can be made there. So that was kind of a sidetrack, but I think this is actually a super important point and kind of one of my, my biggest problems with how machine learning is taught. Well, thank you. Question. Oh, thanks. Last question for now is, uh, and this is a very interesting one. Uh, how can theoretical machine learning research contribute to responsible AI? Oh, that is a great question. And something that I have thought about so much because um, as I said, you know, I, I came from uh, learning theory originally and the first couple of projects that I worked on in the space of fairness were actually on the theoretical side. Um, and I struggled, I struggled a lot when I was first thinking about working in fairness um, because I, I, I think some of the work that has come out of the theory community in this space has been um, worrisome for some reasons. And the particular type of work that worries me is the type where um, you know, people come up with a model and we know that a model is never going to be right, but we come up with some model and design an algorithm that under all of the assumptions of the model guarantees some notion of fairness. But the problem with doing this type of work in the fairness space is that um, you're kind of giving this like fairness check mark to this algorithm and giving uh, people who might implement this algorithm this idea that you know, this is great, this algorithm is fair, I don't need to worry about anything else because um, I'm using this algorithm. But then there are all of these hidden assumptions in the model that was used to design the algorithm. And if these aren't met, then you're not satisfying the fairness constraint. And you're just kind of sweeping all of that under the rug. So I was very much against doing anything um, for myself personally that had this flavor of like, let's design an algorithm with a fairness check mark. Um, 
I, I do think there are ways to do that, but I just wasn't interested in doing that myself. Um, so what I personally found was um, a better compromise and kind of what I used as my own gateway into the fairness space was to use theoretical models to try to understand and illustrate uh, potential ways that things can go wrong with machine learning systems. So, um, you know, I, I think this is useful in the sense that it, it kind of illuminates problems for people. And um, at the same time, you know, if you're showing that even in this toy setting, things are complicated, things can go wrong, and you can kind of illustrate this nicely. It doesn't really matter that it's a toy setting and that your model is not perfect. It's like, you know, if things are bad and complicated in this toy setting, it's going to be even worse in the real world. So I felt like that type of work on kind of illuminating problems and maybe illuminating these problems suggests different um, algorithms or techniques or processes that can be used to fix them. But um, I felt like that was one way that theoretical work could really nicely contribute. And there are a lot of people who are doing like super interesting and uh, groundbreaking theoretical work in the space as well. Um, I think John Kleinberg's group has a number of really nice um, theory papers that are coming out in the space. So if you're interested, I would definitely point you to that. Um, yeah, I think there, I think generally there is a lot of room for theoretical work to contribute. I would just urge people to be cautious about what you're claiming. Sounds good. I think that was it for now. Do you want to take a break? Yes. So I just wanted two hours is a really long time and it's a really long time for me to like sit here and talk nonstop too. So let's just take five minutes. So um, I have 11 past on my, oh no, I have nine past on my clock. So we'll come back at uh, around 14 past and I will start again. So get up, stretch, get some water and then we'll move on to transparency. Okay, great. Welcome back. So uh, we've got about 45 minutes left. And um, in the rest of this time, I want to talk to you about uh, transparency and intelligibility. And throughout this part of the lecture, I'm going to be arguing for taking a human centered approach to transparency and intelligibility. Okay. So first of all, why is transparency important and why should you take a human-centered approach? Well, we often think about machine learning and we often teach machine learning, as I was saying a few minutes ago, actually, as this kind of fully automated process, right? We take some data, we use it to learn a model and out of our model come these automated predictions. But um, people are really at the heart of the machine learning life cycle. And I, again, this is just what I was saying a few minutes ago, right? We've got people who are always there to define the task that machine learning is going to be used to solve. People decide which data to collect. They decide how to clean that data, how to pre-process that data, how to label that data. And the data itself is often generated by people, either explicitly, so for example, through crowdsourcing, or implicitly, for example, if the data contains images of people or text that people have written, right? People determine which model to use. Should we use a neural network, a random forest, a linear model, whatever? Uh, people choose how to train the model, how to test the model. Uh, which may again require gathering more data from additional people. People then make choices about whether, where, how to deploy the model. Um, and of course, these deployed models end up impacting people's lives, sometimes in these high stakes domains like medicine or finance. And finally, feedback from people is incorporated as the model evolves. So given this really central role that people play in the machine learning lifecycle, I take the position that 
building machine learning systems that are reliable or trustworthy or fair requires relevant stakeholders to have at least a basic understanding of how they work. Okay, but what exactly is transparency? So just like with fairness, there's no agreed upon definition of transparency. People use this term in all different ways. And I am not going to attempt to end this debate on what is transparency here and now. So um, let me just tell you what I mean when I talk about transparency. So I find it really useful to break transparency into three components. And this breakdown is adapted from one that was proposed by the European Commission's high level expert group on AI. I like it a lot. So I use this uh, when I talk about transparency within Microsoft. So first of all, transparency relies on this foundation of traceability with um, teams or people who are creating uh, machine learning models clearly documenting their goals, their definitions, and their design choices, and any assumptions that they've made. So all of this needs to be documented. Second, transparency requires communication. People who build and deploy AI systems should be forthcoming about when, why, and how they chose to build and deploy them, as well as limitations of their system. This, this goes for people writing research papers on machine learning too. I don't see enough of people like being really upfront about limitations. The third facet of transparency is intelligibility, just some, sometimes also referred to in the machine learning community as interpretability. I'll use these terms interchangeably for the purposes of this talk. Now, intelligibility means that people should be able to understand or monitor and respond to the technical behavior of our AI systems to whatever extent is necessary to achieve their specific goals. So um, I'm going to dig into each of these three components a little bit more, and I'll start with traceability. Okay, so I happen to be someone who gets really excited about documentation, but I aware that not, I'm aware that not everybody out there shares my own passion for documentation. But I want to argue with you that it's actually really important. So first of all, documenting things like benefits and harms gets the teams who are creating machine learning systems thinking about potential issues early on so that they have more time to catch and mitigate problems. Um, this is very related to what I was talking about earlier with things like fairness checklists. Um, forcing people to think through things, have these conversations, write it down, gets you to catch problems early. Second, documentation provides some amount of accountability, both internally and to users of a system. Third, documentation allows for easier transfer of knowledge. So for example, when someone leaves a project team or when a data set or a model is shared with another team or another organization or university. This is something that comes up all of the time and frankly can be quite a mess to deal with. And documentation is necessary as a foundation later on when we want to communicate about a system or an algorithm or a product to um, users or readers of a research paper so that we can gain their trust. Now, there's no one size fits all way of doing this. Um, and indeed, we need to find ways of making documentation work with processes that people are already using or else they just won't do it. But what might this look like? Um, so let's zoom in as one example on uh, data sets in particular. Okay. So a while back, uh, a group of us at Microsoft Research in New York started a project called um, Data Sheets for Data Sets. This was work that was led by Timnit Gabriel. So inspired by data, data sheets for electronic components, we proposed that every data set should be accompanied by a data sheet that documents relevant information about its creation and key characteristics. These data sheets can help the creators of data sets uncover possible sources of bias in their data or unintentional assumptions that they've made 
and potentially even save time or save money on data collection if it causes teams to think through potential problems in advance. They can also help data set consumers, so people who might be building a model with that data, uh, figure out whether a data set is right for their needs. And if exposed either in whole or just in part to um, end users or readers or whatever external audience, um, they can help these people gain trust. So based on feedback from some early pilots that we ran with data sheets, we updated the list of questions. Um, we've now got specific questions on motivation for a data set, composition, collection process, any pre-processing or cleaning or labeling of the data, intended uses of the data, distribute, distribution and maintenance. And questions about ethical and legal considerations are kind of sprinkled throughout all of these sections. There's also a proposed workflow. So each of these sets of questions should be answered at different phases in a data set's life cycle. And while we're still kind of iterating on this data sheets concept um, and you know, figuring out all these different implementation issues that we need to get through to make this a widespread practice, um, we think there's a lot of potential here. We're actually in the process of analyzing some user studies from the um, summer and have plans to expand our template sometime in the next year. In the meantime, one of the reasons that I wanted to mention this is that um, you can get all get involved if you're interested in being more transparent about data sets and create your own data sheets whenever you release a data set online. So uh, this is particularly true for anybody who is um, you know, doing research in machine learning and creating your own data sets as part of that research, right? So we've already actually started seeing some awesome examples of researchers including a data sheet as part of a paper, either as an appendix or through a separate link. And this is something that I would just love to see become some kind of community standard. So um, keep this in mind if you're releasing data sets. Okay, I wanna move on to communication, but I'll pause in case there are questions so far. There is one, um, it's about in the medical community, they have the saying of first do no harm. Are there any doctrines or mottos that people in the AI or ML community strongly adhere to? Oh, that is such a great question. Um, and I think it's a really important question and one that I wish I had an answer for. But um, right now, I think our community is just not at that point yet. I think our community needs to get to that point soon, um, in my own opinion. And um, I would love to see that happen. Um, there have been conversations along those lines starting to spring up, at least in the research community, um, as part of, uh, you know, as, as a response to what's been going on with things like um, the NeurIPS conference, starting to require uh, broader impact statements in papers. Um, that was kind of an experiment for the first time this past year, and it's going to happen again in some form next year. Uh, but part of the difficulty with requiring people writing research papers to um, kind of, you know, be responsible for writing these statements and be held accountable for the work they're doing is that we don't have these agreed upon norms in the community about like what is and is not okay to work on. So I feel like this is something we kind of need to wrestle with as a research community. Um, on the other side, in industry, there are, um, it's, it's really common now for companies and organizations to have some sort of uh, set of principles that they try to follow with respect to responsible AI. Um, so Microsoft has a set of responsible AI principles, for example, that include fairness and transparency along with um, safety and reliability and privacy and inclusiveness and one other that I should have off of the top of my head, but I'm forgetting right now. I don't know if you froze only for me, but. Um, oh, hmm. have I frozen for other people? Um, it, you're, you're doing fine. OK, good. I think Swift Meal is actually broken, so yeah. 
Phew. Okay. Yes. So, um, so within individual companies, there are a lot of these types of principles popping up that we try to follow as a company, but um, nothing kind of general that spans all of industry. So hopefully that answers the question. Okay. Since our moderator here seems to be frozen, I am going to continue and move on to communication. All right, so once you've documented all of the right information, how do you communicate it to end users, the people who are impacted by a system or even the general public? So data sheets, again, are of course relevant here if you think about how they might be tailored to help this third population of stakeholders and users of a system. Um, another way that we're thinking about implementing communication at Microsoft is through what we call transparency notes. Um, this is a Microsoft thing, but I think it can be used like the general idea is much broader and actually highly related to um, research that's coming out of other companies as well. So things like Google's model cards and IBM's fact sheets. Uh, so Microsoft has now started for some pro AI products releasing um, transparency notes. The example shown here is one from 2019 for face recognition API. Um, it's a publicly available document that details the capabilities and um, critically also limitations of a system and does include discussions of things like how end users should interpret different accuracy measures like false positives and false negatives and examples of how teams who are using the system might try to trade these off against each other in different applications. So basically the types of information that you might need um, to figure out how much you should trust a system or a tool like this and how you can um, make use of it responsibly on your own. Again, this is not just a Microsoft thing. Other companies are doing similar things. Um, Google has model cards, which are really great. Um, IBM's fact sheets are similar. Uh, and I really think that this is something that the academic community could be doing uh, more of as well. So either, you know, releasing a standalone document or model card or something like this with models that are created or just being more intentional again in research papers about uh, documenting limitations of systems. Okay. Um, finally, the third component of transparency, which I'll spend the most time on, is intelligibility or interpretability. So intelligibility means that people should be able to understand, monitor, and respond to technical behavior of an AI system to the extent necessary to meet specific goals of, of the specific stakeholder. Now, there are a whole bunch of different stakeholders of machine learning systems that can benefit from intelligibility. So let me just give you a few examples here. Um, so first, intelligibility can improve the robustness of a system by uh, making it easier for data scientists and engineers to fix bugs. Um, it can help doctors and CEOs and other decision makers who are using a machine learning model to make decisions um, figure out when and how much they should trust the system, uh, leading to better decisions. It can help designers uh, reason about how a system and a model works so that they can then better convey this information to end users through their design. Um, intelligibility about characteristics of the training data uh, can help uncover potential sources of unfairness. We've talked about this already. Um, intelligibility can help dem demonstrate compliance with regulatory objectives, things like GDPR. Um, it can enable new tools that help scientists who are developing models actually make hypotheses about what's going on in the world, so explain their models. This is sometimes called knowledge discovery. And just generally, intelligibility leads to more usable products or more usable machine learning systems. Okay, so there are two really common approaches to intelligibility that are coming out of the work in the machine learning community. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about both of those. So the first type of approach is to design and deploy um, transparent or uh, so-called glass box models that are just intuitively simple. 
right? So simple here might mean something like a small decision tree or sparse linear model, um, something that someone can just look at and to some extent understand. So as one example, my colleague Dan Goldstein and some of his collaborators have some really nice work on simple point system, systems that a decision maker, so for example, a judge, can memorize and apply on the fly without even needing a pencil and paper. Um, they actually show that in many high stakes domains, um, at least when we're dealing with tabular data, these point systems are as accurate or nearly as accurate as more complex models like neural networks. Um, as another example, my colleague Rich Caruana has a body of work on generalized additive models or GAMs that also falls into the same category. So the reason that GAMs are nice is that predictions have a nice additive structure, which allows you to easily visualize the impact of a single feature. So basically, um, there's one individual function corresponding to each feature, and you can visualize that function. And the final prediction is just um, you know, the sum of these functions. So uh, remember this, because I'll come back to GAMS in a little bit. OK. The second common approach is to design simple post hoc explanations for complex models. So you may have heard of Lime or SHAP, and I would put those into this category. So many of these approaches work by approximating a complex function using some sort of simple local approximation, like a linear function that can be easily explained. Um, SHAP, which I'll also come back to a little bit later, builds on ideas from cooperative game theory to assign an importance to each feature, which is intuitively a measure of how much the feature contributes to a particular prediction. But despite all of this really cool research that's going on in the machine learning community, there's still a fair amount of disagreement actually about what intelligibility means and how to measure it. So looking at all of these proposed approaches, it's natural to ask what makes a model or explanation simple, right? And how is simplicity related to intelligibility, right? Do all of these models and approaches for post hoc explanations actually help users achieve their end goals as we would like them to? And there have been a couple of position papers examining this issue. And as Finale, Doshi, Velez, and Bean Kim really nicely pointed out in theirs, the machine learning community often has this, you'll know it when you see it, attitude about intelligibility or interpretability. So this difficulty of defining and quantifying intelligibility is compounded by the fact that there are different types of users or stakeholders, and these users have different needs in different scenarios. So the approach that works best for a CEO making strategic decisions is likely to be different from the approach that works best for a regulator who wants to understand why an individual was not alone. And this in turn is probably different from what works best for a data scientist trying to debug a model. Additionally, all of the approaches I've mentioned so far have focused on intelligibility of the model itself. But if you think about this picture of the machine learning life cycle I showed you earlier, model intelligibility is just one piece of the big picture. And depending on who our stakeholders are or what goals they have, we may want to introduce intelligibility at other stages of the machine learning life cycle too, starting from problem definition to data collection and all the way through to model deployment. Okay, so I want to tell you just a little bit about some of my own work in this space, actually. But before I do that, let me pause for questions. Maybe one of the other organizers can check for me if there are questions. Yeah, I can. I can monitor the chat. Um, we have a very general question, which maybe you want to take later. Um, from Zane, okay. doctors have the Hippocratic Oath. Engineers have the Order of the Engineer. Is there something similar for software developers and ML engineers as a whole? I think, did we take that question? We took a very similar question to oh, that. Oh, I probably stepped away during that time. Um, does, if anybody else has questions, please leave them in the chat or raise your hand, better yet. Oh no, we've hit this end of the day, end of the week thing. Oh, great. Uh, there's someone raising hand. Oh, cool. Um, Rita. 
Hi, hello. Uh, thanks for 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 the the class. It was really good. And I don't really have a question, but it's more of a um, uh, suggestion or or a comment. I think this kind of uh, talk that you gave should be done in schools or for you know right now we are all trying to we're all dealing with AI systems and I, and it would be interesting for you know the, all the kids that are graduating in school to know that they are under these assumptions or are are going to be dealing with all those things so do you like it's just a, a comment so do you actually uh, teach kids those things um so first of all thank you i'm glad that you um i'm glad that you think that this is important and this is exactly why i wanted to um give this talk in the ai school um i i do not uh so i i don't have a university affiliation right now so i do not do this um there are some efforts within uh different departments now to start uh incorporating more of a responsible AI viewpoint into classes or more of an ethics viewpoint. Um, I, I, try to, I try to avoid the word ethics through this whole talk because I, I feel like this kind of triggers people in different directions and I don't think it's necessarily the most appropriate word. But, I, but there are some um, examples with like, I think Harvard is doing something really nice in their undergrad program where they have ethics that's um, kind of incorporated as part of the curriculum all throughout. Uh, other universities have standalone classes that get at some of these issues, but I, I think it's more effective if this kind of material can be included, you know, in every machine learning class, in every class where people are thinking yeah. about these types of issues. Yeah, I think but, that, well, what concerns me is that a lot of people that are, are not in the field are using those systems, like a, a judge that is going to use the system to to see if someone maybe committed a crime or not. Or so what I'm saying is, yeah, I think it it, it is important that everyone, uh, not only the people in the field, to to know that to have this view of the systems, maybe yeah. in high school, um, you know when yeah everybody I mean, every field i am yeah, I, I, I know lawyers and people from other fields and they have absolutely no idea they they don't they don't understand and it's uh it's very dangerous to to give them a system that says something and they they assume it's true because because it, it's a machine telling them yeah. Okay. So first, so I agree totally. First of all, I think that before we even get to that point, we need to train the machine learning community because even people within the machine learning community are not trained to think about societal context and societal implications. And this is so crucial. And we just, we really need to be thinking about this. Beyond that, um, I think what you're talking about actually relates to um, the second component of transparency that I was talking about, communication. I think there needs to be much more communication happening um, with machine learning systems that are released and with machine learning systems that are um, published as research, talked about in the media, all of this. Um, there's kind of this norm right now in the community that people really focus on the positives of their work like it, especially within the well within the research community and within industry right within the research community there's this norm that you really want to like hype up in papers that you're writing all of the positives of your system and really kind of like downplay any limitations um, within industry, of course, you've got all of these sales teams who are trying to sell products. And in some cases, you know, I, I think it actually is beneficial to be upfront, um, even for sales, because you're going to get more trust from customers that way. But there's just, there's so many incentives that go in the wrong direction from really communicating clearly about the limitations. Um, and I, I think we need to do a lot more there. I, I do 
I, in ideal, in an ideal world, I agree with you that this should be taught in school to everyone, but, you know, even if that was happening, there's so many people out there in the world who weren't trained and are already out there being exposed to these systems. So I think, you know, transparency is key for this. We just need to be like really communicating more clearly. Okay, but I'm so glad. it's so good to, it makes me feel so good to hear that you think that this is important. Oh, yeah. I do too. Yeah. Well, thanks for, for your lecture. Yes, great. We have a couple more questions, um, if you want to take them now. Yeah, I'll take them now. I was just going to talk about one more piece of work, but I can um, I can do that in any amount of time. So let's take a couple more questions. Uh, from Jason Lin, we have a question. Do you think the increasing popularity of AI and ML and possible competition between companies is impacting willingness or eagerness to consider and focus on fairness and transparency? Um, so yes, in a sense. So I think, um, you know, one problem that I've seen, and I actually like have some work where we've kind of studied this and written a bit about it is that there are, um, there are conflicts between the incentive structures in companies and in the and between that and in people's desire to do the right thing in terms of fairness and responsible AI. And you know, essentially there are a lot of advocates within companies, um, including many of the people that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis, who care a lot about fairness and transparency and reliability and all of this and want to do the right thing. But the problem is that so many of the metrics that are used within companies to evaluate people's performance and evaluate um, the performance of products as well are focused around more traditional things like accuracy and speed and all of these other metrics. And the problem there is it's not that, you know, in an ideal world, we could get accuracy and fairness. There's not always any necessary trade off there. In some cases, when we're talking about quality of service, fairness actually, you know, comes with increased accuracy. Um, but the problem is that we have limited resources and limited time. And so when a product needs to ship in a week and everyone is really time constrained and something has got to be cut, it's quite often, you know, the responsible AI component that gets cut first because uh, teams need to meet other more standard metrics. Um, I'm not talking about just my own company here. This is something that we've seen in research talking to people across a wide variety of companies. Um, there's always kind of this tension. So I think that it's not necessarily even competition between companies that's the issue here, although that can be part of it, but just the traditional way that companies um, evaluate um, kind of evaluate the success of a product and the success of people. And we need to, if we really want to like make responsible AI this top level priority, then this needs to be um, incorporated into these metrics that we judge people on. Thank you. Um, one last question. Okay. Are there any processes in place where systems or models undergo testing for fairness before being allowed to be deployed for public use? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, yes, <laughs> that is certainly the case. And I think that's going to become like much more widespread. It's not as trivial as it may sound. Like this seems like such an obvious thing to do and it's not easy because even just figuring out, you know, I, I talked earlier in the first half of the talk about um, metrics is one thing, like even just coming up with the right metrics is not always easy. Um, defining the right groups of people that you want to be fair with respect to is not always easy. Collecting the right data is not always easy. So this is not something that is just super trivial to do, but it is happening. And I, I expect this will become much more widespread soon. Okay. Great. So in the last, um, in the next just 10 minutes or so, I want to tell you a little bit about, um, you know, sticking with 
intelligibility here talking a little bit about my own research agenda around this area in case people are curious about what I am personally up to a lot these days. Um, and essentially, you know, I just mentioned all of these concerns with intelligibility and um, you know, different stakeholders with different needs, problems defining what it means and so on. And all of these um, have prompted me in my own work to adopt this human-centered agenda for intelligible machine learning. So within the FATE group, we've been uh, working on this agenda from several angles. So first, we propose that people stop relying on just intuition and instead empirically test which factors of a model um, enable users to better achieve their goals. Uh, we have some work in this space that is examining how factors commonly thought to influence the intelligibility of a model. So things like the number of features and whether or not um, internals or a black box actually impact people's use of the model. Some surprising results. Um, a second angle here is to consider intelligibility beyond the model. So for example, intelligibility of data or objectives or intelligibility of performance metrics. Um, and here, as one example, we have some work looking at how the stated and observed accuracy of a model actually impacts people's trust on it. So how well do people understand accuracy of a model? Um, and finally, we propose that people design and evaluate methods for achieving intelligibility in context with relevant stakeholders. And I'll spend just a couple of minutes really quickly um, diving into a piece of work I've done in this space to give you more of a sense on what I'm working on these days. Uh, so this work looks at how we can evaluate the intelligibility of existing tools with stakeholders in context. Um, it was led by uh, an amazing summer intern, Harman Kaur, and received a best paper honorable mention at CHI 2020. Um, and it's focusing specifically on data scientists building models as our stakeholder of interest. And we wanna know how data scientists perceive and use existing off the shelf intelligibility tools, what challenges they face and what opportunities we have to make these tools better. So this is uh, challenging for a number of reasons. I wanna be super clear here that the reason that this type of evaluation doesn't usually happen in machine learning papers is not because machine learning researchers are lazy or don't care, but evaluating um, these types of things from a human perspective is actually like a full research agenda on its own. So first you need expertise in both machine learning and HCI or psychology or related fields. You need to know both the academic literature, but also understand day-to-day -day engineering practices of data scientists. Um, you need both quali qual yeah, qualitative analysis, so you can actually understand the nuances of how tools are used in context, but also quantitative methods if you want to scale up findings. Um, ideally, a study should mimic a realistic uh, data science setting, but without being too cumbersome. And you need to somehow separate out effects of the model, the intelligibility technique, and the user interface of a specific tool. So we tried to address these challenges. Uh, we recruited quite a diverse team. Um, so Harman, who led the project, has an HCI background. Uh, we had several machine learning researchers like myself and some, da and some data scientists involved. Um, we attempted as best as we could to put these data scientists in context, which I'll get to in a moment. And we used a mix of qualitative and quantitative methods. So we specifically started with some pilot interviews to understand um, challenges that are faced by data scientists in their day-to-day -day work that intelligibility tools could potentially help with. We then ran an interview study to observe data scientists ability to um, use existing tools when faced with these challenges. And then we ran a large scale survey to scale up results. Um, so I won't go into the details of our pilot study, but there we identified a bunch of common challenges. I'll come back to these. In our main interview, um, we designed a study in which data scientists are put in context, working with real data, a real model, and a real tool. Um, we wanted to explore both types of tools that I mentioned earlier, so simple models and post hoc explanations. So we had half of participants use 
um, generalized additive models, which I mentioned earlier, and half use shack. Um, we started with the pre-study interview about experience and then a main study and then follow-up questions. So in the main study, participants were given a Jupyter notebook that was already set up for them. Um, they saw a tutorial on the intelligibility tool that was based on published documentation with a bit more detail added. Um, they then explored a trained model, seeing visualizations from the intelligibility tools. And finally, they answered some questions about the model. Um, so each of the tools that they used, GAMS and SHAP, had three types of explanations. First, something on local feature importance. So a description of how important each feature is for the prediction that's made on a particular data point. Uh, the second is global feature importance. So how important is a feature on the whole across the whole data set? And finally, a visualization that zoomed in on the way that a specific feature, age in this case, impacts the predictions. Uh, we used a modified version of the adult income data set, which predicts whether a household earns more than a certain amount of money. And we modified it to reflect the types of challenges that we extracted during the pilot study. So for example, um, we saw in the pilot that data scientists face problems due to missing values in the data and the way these are filled in. So uh, before training the model for 10% of data points with positive labels, we remove the age value and use the common approach of replacing it with the mean age across the data set, in this case, 38. So this resulted in a model which had this strange jump in predictions for 38 year olds. We hope people would be able to identify that. Um, so a couple of different themes emerged from our qualitative analysis of the data. So first we found there was a set of participants who overused the tools, using them to justify cases when the model exhibited strange behavior. And this led them to put too much trust in the underlying models. So um, as one participant who has given GAM said, age 38 seems to have the highest positive income influence on income based on the plot. Not sure why, but I guess if that's what's shown makes sense. So this is kind of worrisome. Um, on the flip side, we also saw some cases in which participants underused the tools because they just weren't confident about what the tool was showing them. Um, another theme that emerged was the importance of social context. So in particular, participants seemed willing to trust what tools were telling them simply because they were publicly available tools. And one of them said this really explicitly, right? I guess this is a publicly available tool, must be doing something right, I think it makes sense. Okay, so we thought that these results were super interesting and a bit worrisome, but we wanted to scale them up. So we designed a survey to attempt to replicate this interview setting at scale. Um, and I'm not going to go through the details of our survey um, now because I'm almost out of time, but um, I will mention that we saw really similar qualitative themes there. Um, and additionally, we were able to run a couple of quantitative comparisons and found that um, among other things, participants who used GAMS had a higher accuracy on multiple choice questions about the visualizations compared with SHAP and were also more confident, which tells us that um, at least on this task, it seems like uh, participants were doing a little bit better um, using GAMS compared with using SHAP explanations. Uh, but we also found that when we uh, manipulated our uh, our explanations that we were showing them and show them um, kind of false explanations. Um, this caused them to uh, reduce the confidence they reported in whether they thought these explanations were reasonable, but didn't actually lead them to have any increased suspicion about the model or the tool. I know I'm going through these results super, super fast, and I don't expect you to take away all the details. I just wanted to give you like a little bit of a flavor of what the study looks like. And if you're interested in this type of work, I'd point you at the paper for more. But let me just mention um, this work and other work I've been doing in this space suggests several next steps for the research community that I wanna highlight here, because I think this is like a big open direction of work. Um, so first, I think that we need more and earlier interaction between machine learning and HCI researchers. 
And we need that to happen like much earlier in the whole machine learning life cycle. Um, so, you know, human centered approaches should be incorporated into the design and development of tools in addition to their evaluation. This goes beyond um, intelligibility. I think generally we need more people with human centered backgrounds involved in building machine learning systems. Um, second, we need more tools that are designed to encourage deep thinking and discourage people who are building machine learning models from making snap judgments. So as one participant from our study said, there's this concept in UX called thinking fast and slow. And while these visualizations are made to make me think fast, every detail about them requires that I think slow. So again, this is kind of a broader theme that I've talked about a lot today. How do we get people who are building machine learning models to slow down and think about the implications of what they're doing? Um, and finally, in our study, we only had about one hour of time from each participant, and there generally haven't been a lot of long-term studies on interpretability, um, exploring how understanding and using these tools um, evolves over time. Popping up a level, um, I've told you about, you know, these studies run on data scientists, we've run studies on lay people as well that I didn't talk about. But there are many other stakeholders out there who require intelligibility. And there's this huge wide open direction of work here for the research community and in industry to better understand the needs of these stakeholders and how we can actually increase um, their understanding of machine learning systems. And this actually relates a, a lot to this question that was asked a few moment, a few minutes ago about, you know, how we can be training people from other fields, like, you know, lawyers, people in medicine and so on, who might be using machine learning systems. I think additionally, we need to be thinking about how we can be making these tools more intelligible to them so they can better understand and use these tools more responsibly. And finally, I think we need to take this broader view of intelligibility and think about how we can bring it to every stage of the machine learning life cycle in the same way that we need to be thinking about fairness at every stage of the life cycle. Okay, so that is it. We made it with one minute to go. It's not a lot of time for additional questions, but we've been taking questions you know, through the whole last two hours. So I hope that um, people have been able to ask what they want to ask. Thank you so much for that talk, Jen. That was that was amazing. Um, I will actually pause the recording. <laughs>